Hello, my name is Gary Mefford. I'm a clinical specialist with Hike Medical, and there's some things I want to share with you. And we've been talking about this for some time and trying to decide what's the best place to start. But now with this uh, pandemic underway, we believe we've got something that can really make a big difference for these COVID patients in the ICUs. And we'd like to share with you a little bit about our product and about how it can make a difference for you and your patients. So we have worked together with our medical director, Dr. Joe Cronin, and our clinical team and put together what we feel like is a strategy that would allow you to add this uh, ventilation adjunct into your patient's care process and see some real difference with these patients. We kind of looked around at the information that was out there when we started considering this back in March. And one of the early papers that we found was this one from Wuhan, uh, where these, the physicians that had been taking care of COVID patients there early were utilizing an index of a recruitment to inflation ratio to determine lung responses to recruitment. Some of the things that they found early on that patients' lungs were not really reopened well under high positive pressure and may be harmed more than benefited in trying to increase the pressures. Also, they found that alternating supine with prone positioning was associated with increased lung recruitability. So I'm gonna tell you some things about biphasic curious ventilation that um, kind of hopefully you'll see it the way I saw it when I first saw this. Patients didn't reopen their lungs on high positive pressure. What about negative pressure? We knew we had great experience with hypoxemic respiratory failure with this device, and we've seen in almost every case where it's a PDF ratio improves. They also found early on that alternating supine with prone positioning increased lung recruitability. Another thing that I'm going to show you about the high curious ventilator is that it is able to create lung recruitment with a similar inflation pattern to proning. So this can add to that recruitment process. Uh, another paper that we looked at early on was this uh, preliminary observations on the ventilatory management of ICU COVID patients that came from uh, Dr. Gadanoni from Milan. He and several other clinicians, intensive care physicians, had a bit of a discussion, and this is some of the things that, uh, that they were observing early on. First of all, they felt treat hypoxemia first with high FiO2, get that PO2 up there. They also found that PEEP levels that exceeded about 10 centimeters were not increasing pulmonary compliance, and they were having a negative impact on Vita's return and uh, potential higher harm without improving oxygenation. They also found that the long-term proning cycles for these patients was not altering compliance significantly and was leading to high levels of stress and fatigue in, these, in the personnel. Other things that they discussed were hypoxemia is quite prevalent and pulmonary compliance is generally high. They found that high pulmonary compliance with isolated viral pneumonia, the main finding was hypoxemic vasoconstriction, increasing PEEP did not help. PEEP levels they found beyond 15 may compromise right cardiac filling and increase the need for fluid support. So that's where BCV comes in. We have a lot of experience with hypoxemic and hypercarbic respiratory failure using this device as an adjunct to positive pressure as a standalone non-invasive ventilator. And so based on those experiences, we took our advanced algorithm that's normally used for ARDS and modified it to use for these COVID patients with a concept of early application to try to prevent progression of the illness. We have always worked over the last few years with this type, with a concept of the open lung. We've actually done some open lung seminars uh, to talk about how BCV can optimize lung volume by recruiting and stabilizing unstable airways and lung units with negative pressure lung inflation and keeping that going, never allowing the alveoli to collapse. Now we, we have a, a kind of a, one of our foundational papers for BCV and negative pressure ventilation. In this paper, there was two groups of subjects. One was ventilated with positive pressure at a known injurious lung volume of 12 milliliters per kilogram. Uh, things were controlled for indexatory lung volume and carbon dioxide. And another group was ventilated with negative pressure at the same volume and the same controls. In the group that was ventilated with positive pressure, those are the closed dots or the square closed dots in that first graphic. And that graphic is demonstrating the percent of atelectatic lung throughout the respiratory cycle in these subjects. And you can see 
with positive pressure, there is a significantly greater amount of atelectasis through the respiratory cycle, where with the negative pressure lung inflation, much lower atelectasis and much better inflation. And that's the next graphic shows the percent of aerated lung. And you can see in the open dots, which is the negative pressure group, that there is a significantly greater amount of aeration throughout the lungs than there is with a positive pressure breath. So these are some of the foundational differences that we knew. Another uh, uh, graphic from that same paper is here where they looked at PO2 differences. And they found that PaO2 was significantly greater in negative lung inflation versus positive. In these groups, um, ARDS was induced and then ventilation was ensued, one group with negative, one group with positive. And you can see the first dot there on the left, P to F ratio was about 450 or PO2 was about 450. That's the PO2 on 100% oxygen. Then ARDS was induced, I believe it was oleic acid, and then um, ventilation ensued. So with, with once ventilation ensued, things were relatively equal uh, with the P to F ratio above 400. But after that, things w fell apart quite a bit. The positive pressure breaths, the P to PO2 fell below 100 and really never rose above 100 throughout the rest of the study period. Where the negative pressure lung inflation group on the same FiO2, 100% FiO2 and everything else controlled, that negative pressure group had a PO2 of 300 that gradually over the period of the time study floated up to above 400. And that can be equated to P to F ratio since that's 100% oxygen. So we saw uh, a, an initial much higher P to F ratio with negative versus positive, and then throughout the study, that difference just increased. These are the basis, the foundation of demonstrating the kind of difference that negative pressure lung inflation can make. So I came across this paper not that long ago. It was out, come out in 2018. It was uh, written by a group which included uh, Dr. Nader Habashi. And this group was pointing out how the APRV type uh, breath delivery can potentially keep the lungs open and never allow the, the alveoli to collapse. So we took some of these concepts and applied them to our open lung concept. Some of them were opening and stabilizing alveoli would prevent all three mechanisms of ventilator-induced lung injury. Also, progression to ARDS is something that often sneaks up on us. We'll see normal blood gases, relatively uh, normal respiratory status with minimal distress, while unstable alveoli are present and getting worse. We think things are fine, but this is sneaking up on us. And that seems to be uh, reflected in the picture of many of these COVID patients. So by the time the level of lung pathology is present, where we can observe differences in the patient, there is already considerable tissue and surfactant damage that's going to result in significant loss of lung volume and predisposing the lung to lung injury. So the, the core finding, I believe, from this group was similar to what we stated before, never give the lung a chance to collapse. And by doing so, you're going to eliminate most of the mechanisms of ventilator-induced lung injury. This is a, a book chapter from a book called uh, Update in Intensive Care and Emergency Medicine. It was a book series. This is a chapter from that. And I took a quote from that chapter that I felt was really very apropos to what we're doing with this open lung concept. And it really boils down the prime goal of respiratory therapy, which is to increase functional residual capacity. And that's not only to improve oxygenation, as important as that is, but to reestablish normal ventilation of all regions of the lung. In acute respiratory failure, ventilation is endangered by destabilization of alveoli. Apart from interstitial edema, the clinical picture will be determined by the pathophysiologic consequences of increased pulmonary retraction in the lungs and decreased lung volume, leading to reduced compliance, hypoventilation, shunning, and hypoxemia. So with each of these papers, I think, why not negative pressure lung inflation? The consequences of retraction can be resolved if we can recruit those alveoli. Positive pressure has a great deal of difficulty entering into lung pathology, areas where there is a great deal of atelectasis. The air just routes or overstretches elsewhere. 
with negative pressure because the transpulmonary pressure occurs at the periphery of the lung, the pull is outward in all directions and much more even. So even areas of retraction, areas of atelectasis can gain inflation because that pull is into those lung units as well as the healthy lung units. So you don't get as much overstretch, if any, in your healthy lung units. So that helps with, with ventilation in general, compliance in general, and oxygenation. So our concept is the concept of extrathoracic lung casting. We want to open the lung with negative pressure as soon as we recognize the potential onset of hypoxemic respiratory failure. We want to use continuous negative, or if the patient requires ventilation support, highly negatively balanced control mode settings to set a guard against the loss of FRC. We want to use this extrathoracic lung casting at early signs of respiratory distress to prevent lung contracture, prevent illness escalation that would be resultant from loss of FRC and atelectasis. Extrathoracic lung casting can be maintained whether you're using mask or invasive ventilation. You can use it as you can with BCV always with any type of oxygen delivery device. Hopefully this will shorten the duration of the patient's need for positive pressure and lessen the intensity of illness and the intensity of those positive pressure settings. The goal would be for earlier extubation if the patient requires intubation and for all patients a more rapid recovery for a larger number of survivors. Another really good thing about BCV is the patient can mask up. You're going to be able to put an N95 mask on a patient, whatever your standard approach is for COVID positive patients that are breathing spontaneously should work fine with your BCV patients. So, BCV will not produce additional aerosols into the environment than spontaneously breathing. We always encourage everyone to adhere to the hospital's PPE protocol. So that brings us to our algorithm. We looked at a lot of different things. We had an advanced algorithm that included settings for ARDS, and we worked through those considerations and developed these recommendations. So the first thing is recognizing that you have a symptomatic COVID-19 patient that is hypoxemic. And we want to catch them early in the hypoxemic uh, fall. So P to F ratios less than 300, or if you're using SF ratios less than 235, <clears throat> or if you're just getting a number off of pulse ox, SATs less than 90 on room air. Also that combined with increased signs of respiratory distress indicate this would be a good, good way to help the patient. We're gonna initiate oxygen and we're going to start continuous negative. We want you to apply supplemental oxygen as needed with whatever devices you feel are gonna work best for the patient. BCV combines well with every type of oxygen support device. You can apply continuous negative around minus 15. You're gonna get the chest pulled out, you're gonna get the diaphragm down, and you're gonna increase lung volume. Uh, my measurements have shown about a 20% increase in lung, lung volume in FRC with the application of minus 15. If the patient does not respond as well as hope to that minus 15, increase incrementally, I would say by fives, up to minus 30. Beyond minus 30, there can be some comfort issues. If you feel you need to use minus 30 or minus 40, you might wanna consider a little bit of analgesia for the patient who might feel a little bit of excess pressure at the top of the, the sternum. Um, so that's sort of our basic starting point, continuous negative and oxygen. And we really uh, are finding that this, in many cases, helps the patient quite a bit. That you're going to be able to lower the FiO2 setting on many of these patients, and you're going to be able to see improved saturations by using BCV. So from there, we assess the patient as to how they're responding to this. And we should see either uh, the patient remaining stable, or what we would hope to see even more is the patient's oxygenation improves. So as oxygenation improves, you want to titrate the FiO2 down as needed, and you may be able to lower the settings on BCV. So this would be what we would do if the oxygenation improves. We want to reassess that patient frequently and bring the continuous negative setting down per clinical response. So once the patient reaches about a minus eight, minus six, they're able to remain saturated on that with no great distress. They're probably ready to have the Curos off for a trial without it. Also. Weaning the Curos is a little different. Um, we recommend a brief period where the Curos is off for a skin assessment every four to six hours. We also wanna assess the foam seal at that time. 
And during that period, it allows you to assess the patient's ability to tolerate not having the negative pressure. If they look good after a brief break, maybe you can give them a longer one. And that really is basically weaning the BCV. It's really not a complex process. How do they look when we take it off for a brief period? Looking good, then extend that period if you like. Uh, and BCV can be a great tool to help wean patients from positive pressure. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, control mode. So for the patient that is not doing well on continuous negative, we have a ventilation mode. Control mode, you set a negative pressure to create lung inflation. A positive phase uh, facilitates exhalation, and you're setting an IE ratio and a rate. It is a non-invasive ventilator. So in, with this set up that way, you're going to set your rate typically at rates of relatively high. You want the device to basically lift the load for the patient if possible and hopefully decrease metabolic rate while it's provide support. So you're gonna set the rate uh, to exceed what the patient is doing and hopefully the patient relaxes and lets the machine take over. Our IE ratio is gonna be inverse. BCV, due to the active expiratory phase, allows for use of inverse ratio ventilation without development of a great deal of intrinsic peak. So you can now use inverse IE ratios. What that does for BCV is makes the mean curos pressure more negative. That mean pressure is our correlate to end expiratory lung volume. It correlates pretty well to PEEP and mean airway pressure increases and decreases on the positive pressure ventilator. So mean curos pressure is how we moderate oxygenation. We can't deliver oxygen with this machine, but we can potentially enhance it a great deal. And in control mode, first thing you're gonna do is balance the pressures to the negative. You see we're setting a minus 30 plus 10, so our, our negative pressure is typically three times our positive pressure. Our IE ratio, we're starting out at two to one in this circumstance, so that we get a nice low mean curos pressure. And you can even make that more negative by going into a three or four to one IE ratio. And we're setting a high rate. One of the caveats of the higher rates is that at rates greater than 60, we recommend balancing those pressures. So if we've got a delta of 40, a minus 30 plus 10, and the thing I want to caution about this delta, people say, oh, 40 centimeters. Well, we are all trained that we don't want 40 centimeters of airway pressure, but we do, what this is is extrathoracic. This is not airway pressure. So the pressures that can be delivered by the HIAC outside the thorax are not going to create airway pressures that are going to cause any danger to the patient. So, at, but at rates greater than 60, that 40 centimeter delta would have to be halved to be minus 20 plus 20. So the pressures are balanced and then we're not really favoring inflation as much anymore because at these higher rates, intrinsic PEEP could be a potential. So we want to balance pressures at rates greater than 60. Our control mode guidelines, uh, this is part of our basic training teaching, uh, just to kind of cover these. Mean curious pressure should always be kept more negative than minus four. We do not want to allow in control mode that mean pressure to approach zero or go up into the positive range because we always want to favor inflation. And by keeping mean curious pressure minus four or more negative, we're always going to be inflating more than deflating, and that's going to keep end expiratory lung volume up and FRC up. The next one is one of the basic rules of BCV. We talked about it briefly already. We want to keep our negative to positive pressure ratio where the negative pressure setting is three times the positive pressure setting. That helps to guarantee that we're always favoring inflation. That is, again, at rates less than 60. Once the rates go over 60, that same uh, delta of 32 minus 24 plus 8 can be acquired at, by doing 16 over 16, minus 16 plus 16. Our delta, another rule, our delta should always keep our span, as Hyatt calls it, should always exceed 10 centimeters. And that's going to be very, very rare that you're going to use control mode without enough difference between the pressures to create a delta of 10 or more. Also, for patients that are persistently asynchronous, you just can't get control mode to settle them down. They won't relax on it, which is relatively occurs in most cases with uh, respiratory failure, but some patients just keep pushing. If the patient will not allow the machine to help them, then a little bit of sedation, some sort of moderate conscious sedation until they relax on the machine and allow how to let it work for them or learn how to let it work for them uh, may be needed. So from there, we're gonna assess again, is the patient improving or worsening? If they've improved, we're gonna hold the line, keep doing what we're doing. 
um, or if they're, they're unchanged, let's just, just hold in there. This is a great therapy. We're recruiting along over time. It's a recruit maneuver that, that uh, doesn't have to be time limited because there's, we're not adding positive pressure to the thorax. If the patient is not improving, then from that point, if you've gone through this and you still have a declining patient, you need to consider your normal playbook. What would be your next step with that patient? Would it be intubation? Then intubate. Would it be, are they worsening to the point that they may be an ECMO candidate? Then that could be initiated. And the beauty of BCV, this extrathoracic interface can be continued through intubation, post-intubation, and can be used to help you get them extubated more quickly and help extubation to stick. Now, one of the things we talked about that is really key in this is management of the mean curos pressure. P to F ratio can be altered by making mean curos pressure more negative. So we, we always talk about this in basic training, but just to kind of reinforce some of the things that we can do to make mean curos pressure more negative, um, you can alter the IE ratio. So go from the one to one to two to one IE ratio, two to one to three to one IE ratio by creating a longer inspiratory time and a longer period below zero, then you're going to lower the mean curos pressure by altering the IE ratio to extend the inspiratory phase like that. Uh, and again, this is safe because we have an active expiratory phase. Also, you can increase the pressure ratio. So where we normally recommend starting at a three to one, three times the negative being three times the positive setting, you can go to a four to one. So if you are starting the patient at minus 21 plus seven, then you can go four to one minus 28 plus seven, get a more negative inspiratory phase, balance the pressures more towards the negative and get a more negative mean curos pressure. Also pressures can be adjusted while using the same span. So you have the same delta, but you're adjusting the pressures to balance more to the negative. So you could take a minus 21 plus seven, a delta of 28, and apply minus 25 plus three. Now lowering that expiratory pressure may decrease some of your CO2 clearance ability with the device. But if CO2s look good, as it probably does in most of these patients, you can lower the expiratory pressure, increase the inspiratory pressure. The same delta will be balanced more to the negative. So you got a more negative mean curos pressure. This is how we manage end expiratory lung volume, P to F ratio, and oxygenation with BCV. Now, we built into this some of our airway clearance modalities. BCV is one of the most potent airway clearance tools you'll ever encounter. It uses extrathoracic high frequency chest wall oscillation through the curos, applying a negative and positive pressure gradient to the chest that creates a, a very powerful interthoracic wave. It can be adjusted to be very gentle or very intense, depending on the needs of the patient. But that oscillation effect combines with a cough assist effect, which is com both combined in the BCV airway clearance treatment mode or module. So that can be utilized. We're recommending that you use it if you have secretion issues in these patients, which seem more to occur post-intubation. But if you're having secretion clearance issues with these patients, you may utilize this. We've seen sites use it as much as every hour for five to 20 minutes, depending on what they feel will benefit the patient. Use it between periods of proning and continuous negative to break up any secretions that might be uh, retained in the lungs. This timed treatment cycle will go through at least one cough cycle each oscillation cycle. And you may not wish that cough cycle to occur. You might not want to add the extreme inspiration and expiration that occurs with the cough we can set the machine a different way, and that's our option two. You can adjust the control mode breath cycle to be a high frequency chest wall oscillation cycle. So you can set control mode as high as 1200 cycles a minute. We recommend setting it similarly to the way we set our secretion clearance cycles at 800 cycles a minute. Uh, set your pressure in that mode at 25, and you're going to get a great secretion clearance effect without the cough assist coming in each few minutes. Now, this will not time out where the treatment runs as long as you set it for, and then goes to standby. With this uh, mode, you're gonna get 800 cycles a minute as long until you tell it to stop. Now, a couple of things to bear in mind about airway clearance with BCV, whether we're using continuous negative or we're using the purpose-built airway clearance module, 
secretions can come up out of the lungs at any time with just continuous negative. We're opening those airways. We're creating an airway dilation effect that allows more flow. And in some cases, it will dislodge secretions and allow the patient to bring them up when they wouldn't otherwise. With the oscillation effect, we can, we've seen patients that were just nearly overwhelmed with the secretions that were produced by that. So you want to be ready. If the patient is having large volumes of secretions, you want to make sure you've got suction available so that in, in case the patient's not able to clear their own airway um, and, and be prepared for that. But uh, the other neat thing is these techniques can be applied along with positive pressure. So if you've got a patient that's intubated on positive pressure, you can still oscillate their chest and break those secretions up with BCV. The other cool thing is you can use BCV if you've got dorsal infiltrates. And we've heard some recent uh, stories of that, and we've got some, some case studies from, from years past where BCV was applied posteriorly, drawn and sucked down onto the back, and then vibrated on the back to clear dorsal infiltrates when nothing else was able to clear them. So you can use it uh, posteriorly during proning. Um, the other thing is, that needs to be borne in mind is that secretion clearance, that vibration mode does not generate the kind of negative pressure that continuous negative or control mode can. So sometimes during the vibration, the decrease in the mean negative pressure, or if you want to use it the other way, the increase, the, the less mean negative pressure will potentially decrease oxygenation effect. So you may have to increase your supplemental oxygen for the treatment periods. Additional notes that we included in the algorithm, continuous negative can be used alternating with proning sessions. I think I mentioned that briefly. Continuous negative is going to give you a similar inflation pattern to proning. So if you've had the patient face down about as long as they can stand, you can still put them over on their back. Generally, you can get them this to work in a semi-recumbent position and just apply continuous negative and get the, that effect. Uh, also, you can add extra thoracic high frequency chest wall oscillation for retained secretions, as we just mentioned. Another neat thing with BCV is patient-generated aerosols really are not gonna be any greater than the spontaneous breathing patient, so you wanna treat those aerosols very similarly as you would a spontaneous breathing patient. BCV can be used to maintain saturations during intubation. So if you're concerned about desaturation during your intubation period, you can keep continuous negative on the patient, and once you've got them still, their SATs are not going to drop nearly as quickly because you're holding that FRC up and improving gas exchange. Also, BCV can allow you post-intubation to decrease the need for PEEP. Negative pressure can be used to hold the FRC, which is what we're generally using PEEP for, and you can lower the positive PEEP and get a similar oxygenation effect with less uh, positive intrathoracic pressure. BCV can also decrease post-extubation alveolar collapse. It's a great tool for the weaning process. So if you have patients that are in spontaneous breathing trials and they're perhaps failing very readily each time you attempt a, a spontaneous breathing, that uh, you can add BCV into this process. And by maintaining FRC through the spontaneous breathing trial, you won't get that dip in FRC that causes the patient to go into the rapid shallow breathing pattern. Also, many times post-extubation, patients have a dip. They sort of crump after extubation before they get to flying. You can apply BCV and prevent that crump in many cases because it may be due to alveolar collapse and loss of FRC, creating increased gas or increased work of breathing and decreased gas exchange. BCV can help improve that. And then also for the, that patient that is high risk for reintubation, you, you can use BCV as a non-invasive ventilator if you need to. Uh, until they, they're settled. Another thing that we've added in here after looking around at what's going on with these patients, it seems that later in the illness, many of them may develop uh, potential for embolic events. And in these cases, we really don't know how negative pressure and a pulmonary embolus interact. We can't really make good recommendations in this area. So if the patient is at a very high risk for embolic events, you might want to consider alternative means of support until that is clearly sorted out. In some cases, we've seen where it's working so well, they just continued with it, but we're really not internally clear on how these two things go together. So we, our recommendation is to, to consider other um, alternative means of support once you reach that level. So I just want to close by pointing out Everywhere we look, 
maybe it's just my point of view, but it just seems like every time I turn around, there's another physician who is fighting for these patients, who is proclaiming that the standard treatment approach is not working. We've heard of sites that have nearly 90% mortality rate for intubated patients with this illness. Others are doing much better, but we believe we've got something to offer for these patient groups and for those people that are looking for a, a alternative pathway to treat these patients that can result in shorter stays, less potential for intubation, and once intubated, a shorter duration of positive pressure ventilation, DCV, the Hayek RTX, can really be a tool that can make a difference for you. So um, I'm very interested to hear from anybody and anybody's thoughts who might watch this. Um, please feel free to contact us at Hayek Medical. We'd be, we really would like to help you with some of these more challenging patients. Mm -hmm.